Good day, Thomas Jefferson, our podcast listeners. And as always, thank you for listening. We're so pleased today to bring you part three of a series of four conversations with Professor Joseph Ellis about the Adams-Jefferson letters, the collection of letters the two gentlemen exchanged at the end of their lives when Mr. Adams said, we ought not to die before we understand one another. And uh, this week we spend a lot of time talking about poor Mr. Adams. Yes. Well, Jefferson made the mistake in one of his letters of saying, what are the uses of grief? And Adams picked that up and ran with it as he was wont to do. You know, Jefferson frequently, as Joe Ellis says in this episode, would uh, almost innocently or inadvertently mention a, a word like terrorism or grief or abuse of power or ideology or something. And then Adams would would go into some sort of a, almost a mania in sending one, two, or five letters on that subject. And so uh, Adams is, is a self-pitying person at, at, at times in his career in a, in a wonderful and amusing way to us. I'm sure it didn't amuse him. Uh, but he then wrote a long dissertation on the abuses of grief after the death of Hamilton and the death of George Washington and the death of Julius Caesar and so on. One of the favorite, my favorite parts of this week's episode is your reading of of this letter uh, from October 12th, 1823 that, that Jefferson wrote to Adams. And the people are going to hear it in the program, but can I insert just a little bit of it right here? Of course. It would be strange indeed if at our years we were to go on an age back to hunt up imaginary or forgotten facts to disturb the repose of affection so sweetening to the evening of our lives. Be assured, my dear sir, that I am incapable of receiving the slightest impression from the effort now made to plant thorns on the pillow of age, worth, and wisdom, and to sow tares between friends who have been such for near half a century. Beseeching you, then, not to suffer your mind to be disquieted by this wicked attempt to poison its peace, and praying you to throw it by among the things which have never happened, I add sincere assurances of my unabated and constant attachment, friendship, and respect. Thomas Jefferson. Such a beautiful letter. I, I have... Uh, I've been scarcely able to check my own emotional response in reading this to you, Joe. It's always great to listen to you and Joe Ellis. I'm just in awe of the two of you for these these conversations. And we're going to get to the show, but I do want to remind people that you've got some online courses um, that if they're interested in, they can find out more about it at the Jefferson Hour website, jeffersonhour.com. Um, you've also got some cultural tours coming up. Uh, the Lewis and Clark tour is still on and um, your winter retreats. And as always, if uh, you can support the show, you can do that at jeffersonhour.com. Am I forgetting anything, sir? The old cliche that when a door closes, a window opens is sort of true here. The pandemic has forced us all to shelter at home. We're doing that. You, you, you're in one location. I'm in another. Joseph Ellis in a third. And it's given us a kind of an enforced, I won't say leisure, but time that's not structured. And so <laughs> it does. we've been able to have this uh, series of, of conversations with the great Joseph Ellis that we probably would have had a hard time scheduling under normal order. So I'm thrilled because he's as interesting as any historian in this country. And we have a friendship. You can hear it uh, in the kind of ways in which we argue together and the playfulness. Great guy. He's a yeah. fantastic man. And, and he's given us a great gift, a gift to all of the listeners of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. And with that, let's go to this week's episode. And thanks so much for listening. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks, everyone. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation about all things Jefferson. I'm your host, David Swenson, joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and also our returning champion and good friend, Professor Joseph Ellis. Clay? Well, this is the pandemic series. Uh, Joseph Ellis is at an undisclosed cabin. He says it's more like a luxury home up in Vermont somewhere. And I'm in my modest flat here in Bismarck, North Dakota. We're all confined to our houses. Uh, you are in the New Enlightenment Radio Network barn watching the cattle. 
and we thought the three of us would connect electronically to have a to continue our conversation. Uh, Joseph Ellis and I have been talking about maybe the most interesting correspondence in Jefferson's life. I'm not sure it was for John Adams, but the the, the correspondence that began again on January 1st, 1812, and continued up to a few months before their simultaneous deaths on July 4th, 1826. And for our listeners, this was how many letters over what period of time? It's about 156, I think. Adams wrote 2.8 or 3 for every one that Jefferson wrote. Um, Adams had a lot on his mind, and he was not someone who um, restrained himself. You know the famous quip by Mark Twain, I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have time. Um Adams rarely has a thought that he doesn't express somehow, uh, and so he'll write three, four, five letters on a single theme to Jefferson, and then Jefferson might delay two months before responding, and then very carefully pick and choose which of Adams' many topics he will engage in. Yeah, and for our listeners, this is the pre-digital age in which letter writing was an art, and these are two of the best letter writers in late 18th century America. I don't know that anybody's better. Franklin's pretty good, but um, Madison's letters read like the footnotes of an insurance policy. And, um, <laughs> poor Madison. Yeah, yeah, poor Madison. But um, um, but let's get, let's let the games begin and and let readers know that um, there's a deliberative process in the thinking of people who are writing letters back in the 18th century that doesn't exist for emails, and I wish could, we could recover. Particularly, Joe, uh, for Jefferson. So we know that Jefferson often wrote a draft of a letter before he wrote his final copy. When he wrote his final copy, he made a copy, either by hand or using one of his primitive copying machines. Jefferson didn't just dash something off. He thought through each paragraph, thinking about the recipient, the, the recipient's view of the world, ways that he could flatter or conciliate the recipient, uh, areas that they had in common, ways if he had to say something potentially um, uh, tension-producing, how to say it in the lightest way, and then to finish it by saying, but if we, if we disagree, my friend, we disagree as rational friends, Jefferson was was the exact opposite of the person today who texts or tweets or dashes off an email. But but Adams was, uh, was of course, of the same era, but a little less controlled, wouldn't you say? Oh, God, yes. But I think one thing they shared temperamentally and uh, historically was a recognition that these letters that they were writing were performances on their part. That is, they knew that they were going to be read by posterity. And that's one of the reasons that they both did the correspondence, that these letters would be preserved and people would be reading them hundreds of years later, which they are. Uh, and in that sense, both of them are posing for posterity. Jefferson is a much better poser. Um, <laughs> Adams can't hold the pose. Um, <laughs> and that's what makes it an interesting... And in an era where we're sort of paralyzed by partisanship, Here's a really wonderful moment when two people who fundamentally disagree recover a friendship and really love each other despite their differences and can talk about the differences very clearly and cogently. And um, such creatures are rare indeed in America today. I agree, of course. Uh, Jefferson is a different cat uh, from, from John Adams. Jefferson is reserved. Uh, he's detached emotionally. He's very private, even secretive. Um, he doesn't want to reveal much about his own life. He doesn't really like to look to the past much, even the past of his own life very much, although he was eager to make sure that posterity uh, put him in the proper position in Trumbull's painting of the Declaration of Independence and that his primacy in that greatest of American documents was unchallenged. But Jefferson doesn't really want to get have a couple of bottles of wine with Adams and and get sloppy. Jefferson wants to control the discourse and be very self-protective and and as you know, Joe, that's the opposite of Mr. Adams. Most of what we now look back on as the most interesting controversies they have and I'm sure and we want to get into those as soon as possible are generated by Adams. Um, sometimes Jefferson will innocently say something and Adams will take it in a much more 
radical or controversial direction. And I agree with your assessment of the two temperaments. For, for Jefferson, argument is like dissonant noise in his mind. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like controversy. He wants, you know, the, he wants it to be smooth and, and serene. For Adams, argument is the highest form of conversation. Um, he can't imagine, and he's married to somebody who, who, who agrees with him in that. Um, uh, one thought I have is, do, can you ever, Clay, can you imagine Thomas Jefferson being married to Abigail Adams? No, not for a minute. Yeah. You can imagine Adams, Abigail, with, you know, sitting in Monticello, said, we're selling this, and we're, getting, we're freeing all the slaves. I mean, it's, it's a very... And she's an independent creature. Um, um, at any rate, let, let me surrender control to you and let you pick the issues that we want to hit. Well, let me just re- sort of conclude this little introduction by saying that Jefferson's motto was take things always by their smooth handle. Uh, that's the one I was looking for. It just I forgot the quote, but thank you. He was a harmony obsessive, and he didn't like to fight. And in fact, he papered over difference in direct communication by letter or in person with people that he disagreed with profoundly. And that led many people, many people who actually respected Jefferson, to see a certain kind of duplicity in him or a lack of, 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 of candor or, or transparency about his views that he was so eager not to have a fight, not to have a, an awkward moment, that he tended to lighten his disagreement with people when he was in their presence or, or writing to them, but then he would get Madison or James Callender to to attack them uh, in essays in the press. And when they realized that the Jefferson they knew and thought and and trusted was actually working under the radar to to fight against their their favorite principles, and he wasn't there. Was, it was not uh, there was no harmony between Jefferson the Machiavellian. And Jefferson, the you know, character out of a Jane Austen novel, and, and that led a lot of people to lose respect for him. Yeah, one of them was Washington, who um, who very much appreciated Jefferson's mind and temperament. But during his presidency, when Jefferson was his Secretary of State, Jefferson was sniping at him behind the scenes and um, suggesting that he was senile. And that, um, uh, and that the real power behind the throne was Hamilton. That wasn't true, um, but he revealed this thought to an Italian. What's the Italian's name? Philip Matsai. Matsai published it, and it came out. And um, Jefferson wrote a letter to Washington saying, I don't really know what he's talking about. It's not true. But from that point forward, Washington never trusted him, and when Washington died and Jefferson was president and asked Martha if he could come down, it was only 12 miles to Mount Vernon from Washington, she said, my husband said he will never wish you won this property. Wow. So let me turn to really a question that's been rattling around in my head, Joe, since we had our initial conversation a few weeks ago about this although it's part of an ongoing conversation we've been having for years. Why did Adams want Jefferson's friendship? John Quincy Adams never got over the way Jefferson and Jefferson's henchmen had treated John Adams and the Adams administration. He he resented Jefferson. He read Jefferson's correspondence after Jefferson was dead and wrote voluminous, sarcastic notes about Jefferson. Abigail had a hard time forgiving Jefferson, although eventually she did. What I get the opportunism that Adams can only gain by being attached to the author of the Declaration of Independence in this late correspondence. But why, my question is really a, a fundamental one. Why did John Adams want to be friends with a man he disagreed with on basic outlook on life, human nature, and politics, and someone who by any rational measure had done him enormous damage in the years between 1792 and, say, 1803. Yeah, and they, they had run against each other twice for the presidency, and Adams won the first one in 1796 and Jefferson the second in 1800. I think my short answer is that they truly had bonded early in the 1770s and early 80s as brothers, as part of the band of brothers 
the founding brothers. I wrote a book by that title. And that that bond was real. Um, they saw themselves as members of a political elite that had forged a revolution together and that that revolution had enormous consequences. They disagreed about what those consequences were. Adams was a realist, Jefferson an idealist in that regard, but that bond never went away. That was there. It could always be drawn upon. They both knew it. Um, they had both taken leadership together when it wasn't fashionable. Adams even more so in the Continental Congress than Jefferson, but that they, they respected each other in a soulful way because of the, their location in, an, in the most important moment in American history. David, I, I, I want to turn to you here for a moment. David Swenson, the semi-permanent guest host of the Jefferson Hour. Isn't it fun? We get to talk to Dr. Joseph Ellis, and I so envy and admire Joe. He'll say something like, well, they were, I suppose you'd say a band. Of, I wrote a book uh, by that title, and uh, you know, <laughs> Jefferson was something of an American sphinx. So I actually wrote a book by that title. And, uh, Adams Adams was an emotional man, kind of. You might even call him a passionate sage. Oh yeah, I wrote a best-selling book on that title. Uh, and, listen, and Washington right. was a little more aloof. I mean, he sort of was seen as His Excellency. Oh yeah, I wrote that book too. Yeah. On that note, we'll we'll give Professor Ellis just a moment to uh, collect himself from all of that and uh, take a short break. I'm never going to recover, yeah. Um, <laughs> let's, let's take a break. Yes, and we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation about all things Jefferson. We're joined this week by the creator of The Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and the author... Joseph Ellis. And gentlemen, if I might ask something of the both of you, thinking about letter writing during that time, I know from previous conversations with Clay that um, people expected, uh, people like Jefferson expected that their mail would be opened and it would be read. And uh, I also know from previous discussions that uh, Jefferson destroyed uh, some of his mail. So I guess the question is, did these two gentlemen know and ex or expect that their letters would be read? Well, let me get in quickly and then turn to Joe. Jefferson destroyed some letters, the letters between himself and his late wife, Martha, and probably others that we're not aware of. But he was pretty careful to preserve everything. He had that sort of librarian's obsession with record keeping and keeping copies of records and so on. But I just discovered something in the correspondence today, Joe. At a certain point, um, John Adams says, you know, you may be worried about the security of the mails, Mr. Jefferson, but I can tell you that every one of your letters so far has come unmolested, unopened by meddlers in the post office system, that you can feel secure, at least up until now, that your letters are reaching me without having been, their privacy having been violated. I found that pretty interesting, Joe. I mean, yeah, I remember that. And uh, there's another editing process Jefferson does on his letters after his retirement from the presidency, one of his projects is to go back and change some of the letters he wrote during the coming and onslaught of the French Revolution, because he looked, uh, you know, his endorsement of the French Revolution was total, and he didn't foresee the massacre, the, the death toll and everything. And later in the correspondence with Adams, he admits this and says, you were right and I was wrong about it, which is a huge concession. But he also edited his correspondence to make himself look a little less naive. By the way, Washington did the same thing with his correspondence from the French and Indian War days, when some of his behavior looked like it was fawning and, and uh, sycophatic towards British uh, officials, and he, he edited that stuff out. Um, um, Adams never edited his letters, and he, when he first started reading them in his retirement and opened up the, the vault that they were in, he said, um, God help me if, they should ever, if posterity should ever see these letters. Um, but he didn't change any of them. You know, Joe, I think I remember reading in, in the opening of, of Passionate Sage, your magnificent book on the character of John Adams, that 
um, Adam said, like, nobody will ever really be able to read everything that I've written. And you say, that's right, that he, that he dwarfs the other founding fathers in the sheer output of the diaries, the letters. And most of the founders, when you read their diaries, if you read Washington's diary, it's about the weather. <laughs> you know, the very day that he's leaving the presidency in 1796, 97, I guess 97, that he's leaving uh, uh, Philadelphia. And you think, what does he think? And, you know, what's, you know, he's leaving public life. And it says, you know, April 3rd or whatever day it is, 1797, a day like all days, 48 degrees centigrade or uh, Fahrenheit. And it's, that's it. Adams is, it, Adams talks about not the weather, but the internal weather. What's, what, what's, <laughs> you know, the wind cutting through his own soul. And it's interesting that Jefferson didn't do that. Um, he, you know, he, he, I think he thought it was vain to do that. He did, you know, his uh, his entry for the of his account book for July fourth, seventeen seventy six, a day that you might expect to be a a signal day in his life. Jefferson writes, "Well, I bought a few pair of gloves and a couple of thermometers, and the temperature is seventy eight degrees or whatever it was." Um, mm -hmm. He's very taciturn, but and then, as you know, two days before that. John Adams had said, the 2nd of July will be remembered forever because it's the day of our independence. That's right. We need he writes to Abigail. He gets the, everything right. He says, every, he said, the celebration of this will have, he, said, you know, he describes fireworks. Pompous speeches, parades. He got everything right except the date. He said the day was going to be July 2nd because that was the day they voted on independence. Um and not the day they supposedly signed the declaration. They really, there was never a signing day, really. Well, most of them signed on August second, and um, but uh, the fourth becomes the day because that's what the date that the printer got it from the Congress and put that date on the top of the document, July fourth. But Joe, that's just the kind of thing that drove John Adams batty. That the vote was on the second. That was the key moment. That's when the people had the moral courage to vote for independence. That was the day that we took action to be independent of Great Britain. And then two days later, the news release, written by the elegant young Mr. Jefferson, uh, takes over and becomes the date in American history. That's, as you know, that's exactly what got under the skin of Mr. Adams. It did. He, he uh, in letters to Benjamin Rush that he writes, it's a series of letter correspondence that he has. It's pretty interesting. Some Mad Hatter kind of correspondence, <laughs> they, which they compare their dreams with each other. And um, <laughs> um, but he says it was a, it, you know, it, it creates a fiction. Um, it, he calls it a coup de theater um, um, that we think that that the document that Jefferson wrote is the real founding document. It really isn't, according to Adams. Of course, it would have been if Adams had written it. <laughs> and, uh, but <laughs> but uh, I, I've always thought that the date was wrong, you know, celebrating the 4th was wrong, but they somehow subconsciously decided to make it right by dying on that day. Um, and uh, I mean, I think they almost willed their deaths. Of course. They, and because uh, who could have ever made that happen? You know, I think Monroe dies on the fourth, and Madison's aiming to die on the fourth, but I think he dies on June twenty eighth. But they're all trying to die on that day. Well, Ma Monroe did die in the in the eighteen thirties on the fourth of July. I'm sure Madison thought about it and then said, "No, that wouldn't be fully deferential to the sage of Monticello." Just to stick on this for a minute. So first of all. Um, Adams resents that that Jefferson ran away with the coup de theater of the Fourth of July. Then his next line of argument is, "Well, I could have written it. I should have written it, but I was obnoxious, so I gave it to Jefferson. If I'd known, you know, so I gave it to him." When that argument didn't work, he picked up the Mecklenburg hoax theory and said it was all plagiarized anyway. I don't know what we're making such a big deal out of this for. He's referring to a document that came out of Mecklenburg, North Carolina, around Charlotte now, and. Uh, a document that it was written in this earlier 1770s, and it was almost word for word portions of the Declaration, and um, it was probably a forgery. and And Jefferson said that, but Adams in in his and Adams said, "Okay, I take your word for it." Then he wrote some other person and said, "I don't really believe him." <laughs> but my point, Joe, is that Adams uh, was fixated on this problem, and he could never just say. Jefferson wrote a magnificent Declaration of Independence. No, and there's no question. I mean, as an Adams fan, as you know me to be, 
Thank God Jefferson wrote it. Um, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been the lyrical oh document my. that has become the American creed if, if Adams had written it. We wouldn't have words that begin, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That creed that we now regard as the American creed wouldn't exist. So on that score, Jefferson is the superior man. So he would have said, Adams would have said something like, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Footnote, well, not really equal, because beauty <laughs> and power right. and money they, and the right they really for distinction. Aren't equal. They have equal rights, but they're not really equal in terms of gifts and abilities, et cetera, et cetera. And self-evident, I'm not so sure it's self-evident. I mean, if you look at Prussia and if you look at the states of Northern Italy and Russia, no, there's not much. I mean, ir irrationality is the centerpiece of, hu of human nature. Even to say something is self-evident is probably a kind of pose. I'm starting to feel pretty sorry for our Mr. Adams. You know, Clay, you have oftentimes accused me of being an Adamsite. In fact, in my office, I have a portrait painted by none other than Brad Chrysler of Adams hanging. You know, the guy, he had a hard life. And, you know, it's almost as if you want proof that life isn't fair, read his biography. Well, Jefferson had a hard life, too. Um, they all had hard lives. But one time, um, Abigail's sister asked her whether, if she had to do it over again, she would marry Adams, John Adams. And she said, I cannot imagine suffering with anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's a great line, isn't it? It's true, too. Uh -huh. But from a scholarly point of view, and you know, Clay knows this, over the last 20 or 30 years, Adams' uh, legacy and reputation has been in the ascendance. And to some extent, Jefferson's has been in, on the decline. Very much so. Largely because the central window through which he is being viewed is race, and that's not going to be good for him. Um, whereas on the Adam side, um, uh, his realism and his um, his more um, realistic view of human nature, which is uh, to say that um, it, he doesn't share Jefferson's somewhat utopian view of our of our character. Um, it's difficult to be as optimistic as Jefferson after you know about the Holocaust and if you know about the atrocities of World War One and Two, and or if you read Sigmund Freud. Um, and Adams is more compatible with some of those modern day recognitions and or values. But I'm moving this to things that it might touch some of uh, Clay's own convictions on this score, so I'll shut up. You talk about uh, Adams' uh, ascendancy in his, in his reputation, and I, I would submit that your work, Passionate Sage, had something to do with that. No question. I would so like to believe that, but uh, like um, David McCullough wrote me after uh, at the book, and he said, um, I started to write a joint biography of Jefferson and Adams. And after six months, I decided that I didn't like Jefferson. And I loved Adams. And I'm going to write a book about Adams. Do I have your permission to do so? <laughs> I said, David, for God's sakes, you don't need my permission to do anything you want to. And he wrote a book, which, while passionate sage... You know, I stand behind it, and I'm I'm, I'm happy I wrote it. I, you know, and um, but uh, his biography of Adams hit a much larger audience than mine, and mine hit a scholarly audience pretty hard. But the pop and a pop public audience to some extent. But I think McCullough deserves credit for really uh, bringing the Adams message to a much larger readership. One thing that you've talked about before, and I wish you would share again, is uh, your students when you uh, assign them to read about Adams and their reaction. Right. I, I taught it, God knows, I taught at Yale, I taught at West Point, I taught at Mount Holyoke, I taught at Amherst, I taught at Williams, most of the time at Mount Holyoke. But I, one of my regular seminars was a seminar on the Adams Jefferson relationship and um and uh and the correspondence that we're referring to here, which is published by North Carolina Press and um in a paperback edition, the Adams Jefferson correspondence it's called, um, was assigned and most young women and men went into the class presuming they were going to like Jefferson and not like Adams. And they came out 
quite thinking differently, most of them. Now, I like to believe that wasn't simply because the professor was forcing it upon them, but that I think is the reading of the letters themselves. You can't come away from it without falling in love with, with John Adams and, um, and his irascibility and his, um, his honesty, really. Um, uh, and one student who later went on to become head of Showtime um, uh, put up her hand and she said, this is Jefferson, and she waved her hand in the air like a float, something floating. And then she took her hand and made a fist, and she thrust the fist forward, and she said, that's John Adams. I always remembered that. So picking up on that, Joe, I'm looking at a letter written by Mr. John Adams to Thomas Jefferson on March 2nd, 1816, and it led to one of the really extraordinary exchanges between the two of them. And Adams begins, Dear Sir, I cannot be serious. I'm about to write you the most frivolous letter you ever read. Would you go back to your cradle and live over again your 70 years? So Jefferson gets this letter, and he replies more quickly than he normally does. This one intrigued him. He wrote one of his greatest letters in which he says something like this. I'm paraphrasing. You ask me this question. It's not really frivolous at all. I've thought about this. Yes, I would live my life over again. In fact, I would live it over again as often as the Creator gave me that opportunity with these conditions. I would not choose to live from 1 to 25. No rational being would do that. But from 25 to 70, or maybe even a little beyond, until my body and my mind began to loosen their grip a little bit, I would live my life over again and again. He said, it's a good world. I steer my bark with hope ahead and fear astern. Uh, yes, even in every life, there are great setbacks. But on, uh, on average, if you do the math, there is more pleasure than pain in life. And so, yes. But then he says, I now wish to ask you a question. My learned friend uh, from uh, Quincy, Massachusetts, maybe you will consider this one frivolous. What are the uses of grief? He said, I have lost almost everything that I ever loved, and I can accept most of the economy of the world as providential and good, but I cannot find uh, uh, an adequate justification for how much we have to grieve and mourn in life. Amazing. So your man John Adams wrote back uh, several long letters about this subject. He went nuts, yes. Yeah, it's, and, and he was great. But here's the, here's the thing that I find so interesting in this. Adams, in his reply, says, I agree with you, Mr. Jefferson, but on one condition that you probably will not grant, I only agree to live this life if I know there is an afterlife. If there's no afterlife, if after death it's annihilation, then no rational being would choose to live his life over again. It is only the promise of a happier post biological existence that enables us to get through life. That's a big distinction. It is. It is. Um, and uh, you, uh, you're you calling my attention to something I had not remembered, And um, but it, it's um, uh, neither Jefferson nor Adams were true Christians in the sense that they believed that when they died, they were going to go to some place called heaven or hell. Um, they would talk about it metaphorically. Adam said heaven, you know, was a place where he could argue with Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> and Franklin, and Paine, and Condorcet, and Voltaire. But, but Adams also said that if it can ever be shown conclusively that there is no hereafter, my advice to every man, woman, and child on the planet is to take opium. Um, and what he's really saying is that most human beings need to believe in their immortality or else, and without that, that, that something important will uh, evaporate and not exist for them. And, um, and yet I'm not sure he believed it himself. Um, uh, so, um, but what what he's really saying in the exchange about grief, and he writes, as you say, long, long letters, and 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 he's and and uh, Jefferson says, I think you've exhausted the topic, <laughs> and, and he said, No, I've just gotten started, for God's sake. 
it's really a debate about the role of the emotions as opposed to reason. Um, um, Adams is a student of the Scottish Enlightenment more than the French Enlightenment. Jefferson, just the opposite. And for, for Adams, it's, it's uh, David Hume and Adam Smith and people who put an emphasis on the role of the emotions in, um, in our lives. And, but his real source isn't another book it's his own soul for Adams. He's always introspecting and detecting the vanities and the ambitions that keep thundering through his soul. And, you know, there's one quite wonderful letter from Abigail who begins, Down, vanity. And, um, <laughs> and so he is much more conscious in himself and in society of the irrational and, the, and than Jefferson is. Gentlemen, we need to take just a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of The Thomas Jefferson Hour, a conversation with the great Dr. Joseph Ellis, now emeritus in an undisclosed location in the woods of Vermont. You know, this has been such a rich conversation, my favorite of our uh, dialogue so far. I was just thinking about the difference in their views. You know, when you read the correspondence, you realize, oh, I would have thought that Adams was a, a traditional um, New England Calvinist Christian and Jefferson is a Virginia deist. But no, uh, Adams is a Unitarian in many respects. He's a deist in some respects. He's a skeptic in many regards, and he agrees with Jefferson about the corruptions of of Christianity, including recent. Christianity in his own region of the country. But here's the distinction, I think. You nailed the first part of it, and I'll ask you about this, what I think to be the second rung. Uh, the first part is that Adams believed that uh, an afterlife is essential, maybe not in terms of physics, maybe there is no afterlife, but if humans don't have that illusion for themselves, that there is a, a world beyond, they then we may as well take opium and just... And just um, uh, live a life of an, uh, uh, self-pleasure, narcissism, and hedon hedonism. But his it's, second, yeah, it's a position that William James takes a century later, uh, the, the will to yeah. believe. The second argument I think that distinguishes them is that Adams believes that religion is an important social restraining mechanism, that you need religion in a in a culture, particularly in one that's lightly governed like a republic. There needs to be uh, some sort of an agreed upon uh, liturgical, theological, doctrinal, congregational entity. It doesn't have to be a state church, but it has to be something, because if you if you remove God and religion entirely from the equation, you probably can't keep the lid on humanity. And you could then argue, but Jefferson's on the real other side of that because of his commitment to the separation of church and state. And his insistence that um, uh, on that principle, which is one of his major contribution to Western thought, um, Adams doesn't disagree with that really, um, uh, because he associates most established religions as sources of tyranny and parts of a feudal past. But he wants you to believe in something larger than yourself. In some sense, when they talk about the revolution, they didn't call it the revolution. They called it the cause, the cause. And the cause had for them a semi-religious connotation. And they didn't say God, they said providence. The providence was on our side. Otherwise, we would have never won the war and created this nation state. There's something they share that's not strictly doctrinal religion in the conventional sense of the term, but it's... There's a civic religion, at least for Adams, that's required. Well, and he's coming out of a New England tradition, which is Puritan Puritanism, it's neo-Calvinism. Um, he becomes, as you say, a Unitarian, um, and the current Unitarian minister at Quincy is one of the biggest a Adams fans you're ever going to find. Uh, for Adams, because he believes that human nature is itself corrupt, and innately depraved, he's got to believe something can rescue that kind of creature from himself or herself. Jefferson doesn't need to believe that. He's already thinking that human beings are 
rational creatures driven mostly by well intentions and the any collection of them like you know any jury is going to make the right decision and the voters will make the right decision um adams doesn't have that faith when when jefferson's writing these letters to adams and adams can't get jefferson to engage on certain questions that jefferson is slips the noose he slips the knot and he goes back into what i would call sort of jeffersonian bromides the weather his recent reading uh the cause uh the band of brothers etc uh do you think adams turns to abigail in the house up there the in in quincy massachusetts and says i just can't get him to fight with me i just i can't I can't get under the, 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 the armor. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure he talked to Ad, Abigail. I mean, Adam, Abigail read all these letters. Um, and, um, and her only entry, I mean, her, her comment on it is a comment. She makes a footnote to one, or she writes a paragraph at the end of one of John's letters to, to Jefferson in which she says, you know, she's so glad that, the two of them have recovered the friendship and that she too has recovered her respect and friendship for Jefferson. So I think that, that now the, the, the fact that they can't agree isn't as important as that they recovered the friendship. Oh, I agree with that. I think that for Adams particularly, the renewal was some sort of a, a almost a validation it it, it 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 was redemptive for him somehow, and it's not that he was borrowing fame and and glory from Jefferson, but it meant, I mean, it meant that Jefferson didn't just write him off and turn away forever. That that no, and Jefferson didn't. That's you know, I mean, he didn't. He didn't say stop talking about that. Um, he kept trying to change the topic, and he was more comfortable with uh, safer topics like. Um, the voca- you know, the, the language of, of the United States should have a separate language, or, or Native American uh, ethnography. And, yeah, and um, um, which I mean, anyway, we won't get. But um, um, the important thing to them at the time, as the correspondence proceeded, was it was working. That the Russian intention to bring them back together was succeeding, and that at some really deeper level that meant good things for america that that in that they knew they represented different sides of the american revolution or the cause but they knew i mean in some sense they created a framework in the constitution and and neither one of them was present at the constitutional convention jefferson was in france and adams in england but that um uh, uh, that and the Constitution reflected a view of human nature that's much more akin to Adams's than to Jefferson's, but that it was that America was an ongoing argument, and that they were the representatives of the two sides of that argument, and that that was very fulfilling. So back to grief for a moment. So Adams raises the question: Would you live your life over again? Jefferson says a qualified yes. I'm an optimist. Adams responds and says, I too, although um, futurity, uh, the afterlife is essential to this equation. And then he waits a, a week or so, and then he writes this other letter to Jefferson. And he says, and by the way, you asked me, what are the uses of grief? Don't ask me about grief. No one has known more grief than I have. No man in the world, in the history of the world, has more to grieve about, has been more misunderstood, has been more vilified, has been more deliberately abused. And then he goes into this long, wonderful litany. He says, you want to hear about grief? How about the grief when Washington died? Man, uh, you, you'd think that the savior had died. Uh, they used it for pure political purposes. Yes, he was a great man. And he says, and don't get me started on Hamilton. Man, did they make a big deal out of that? And then after this long attack on everybody, he, he comes and he says, this is a great moment because he he's almost frightened of himself. He says, you know, I could bring up the abuse of grief about the crucifixion of Jesus and all the terrible things that have been in the name of that grief. But maybe I shouldn't go down that path, Mr. Jefferson. So what is it about Adams, uh, Joe, that, and I'm not trying to be hard on him, he had so much rage built up in him that every time Jefferson threw him any kind of a red meat or anything that could be perceived as red meat, Adams had to unload a lifetime of, of frustration. (laughs) 
it was built up. It was latent in there, and it was buried down there, and Jefferson called it out, and it just gushed. <laughs> um, it, these were gush letters. These were... Um, now, I'm trying to find meaning in the gush by talking about the, the significance that emotions had for Adams and not for Jefferson. Um, but uh, uh, they are on display a man who is uh, always slightly out of control. That's right. And who's... And he knew it. And he knew it. And he knew it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, he, and, he, and he was fascinated by it also appalled as a good Calvinist must be, but he couldn't help it. And he, at some point in his life, he just said, Oh, the heck with it. I'm just going to be who I am. Yeah. I mean, he was demonstrating that Franklin was right. When Franklin wrote to the continental Congress in 1785, 86 and Adams and Franklin were serving on the peace commission or were serving in, in um, France. And he said, John Adams is is sometimes a great man, sometimes a, a good man, off, often a great man, but sometimes absolutely out of his senses. <laughs> so, Joe, I want to flash forward to one of the very late letters. Um, Abigail is still alive, although her health is poor. Um, Adams is in no great shape himself. He's down to, I think, one tooth or a couple of teeth. Um, the, a letter is leaked into the publication in which Adams, uh, back in the day, back while he was in president, wrote some very, very negative things about Thomas Jefferson. And, and uh, Adams knew that Jefferson would, would have been aware of this now, that this was, uh, this was getting in all the newspapers. And here, after all of this time, um, another chance for the friendship to, to flare up into open disagreement and maybe break down altogether had come. Uh, it was really awful stuff that Adams had written about Jefferson. And Jefferson then sits down, and he writes Adams this beautiful letter. This read it, Clay. It's one of the best letters I've ever read. Jefferson says this. He's written quite a bit earlier already in the letter. He says, Putting aside these things, however, for the present, I write this letter as due to a friendship coeval with our government, and now attempted to be poisoned when too late in life to be replaced by new affections. I had for some time observed in the public papers dark hints and mysterious innuendos of a correspondence of yours with a friend to whom you had opened your bosom without reserve in which was to be made public by that friend or his representative, and now it is said to be actually published. It has not reached us yet, but extracts have been given, and such as seem most likely to draw a curtain of separation between you and myself. Were there no other motive than that of indignation against the author of this outrage on private confidence, whose shaft seems to have been aimed at yourself more particularly? This would make it the duty of every honorable mind to disappoint that aim by opposing it, um, the impression sevenfold shield of apathy and insensibility. With me, however, no such armor is needed. The circumstances of the times in which we have happened to live and the partiality of our friends at a particular period placed us in a state of apparent opposition which some might suppose to be personal also, and there might not be wanting those who wish to make it so by filling our ears with malignant falsehoods, by dressing up hideous phantoms of their own creation, and so on. I, I skip over a little. Be assured, my dear sir, that I am incapable of receiving the slightest impression from the effort now made to plant thorns on the pillow of age, worth, and wisdom, and to sow tares between friends who have been such for nearly half a century, beseeching you then not to suffer your mind to be disquieted by this wicked attempt to poison its peace, and praying you to throw it by. Among the other things which have never happened, I add sincere assurances of my unabated and constant attachment, friendship, and respect, Thomas Jefferson. How about that, Joe? You can't beat it. I mean, there he is in, in his best way, and um, and his is humanity. Um, and they all talk about reaching out now. And it means almost anything. It means sending an email. And that's a really reaching out. The, the second letter is from Adams to Jefferson about three weeks later. Your letter was brought to me by the post office when at breakfast with my family, I bade one of the misses open the budget. She reported a letter from Mr. Jefferson in two or three newspapers. A letter from Mr. Jefferson, says I. I know what the substance is before I open it. There is no secrets between Mr. Jefferson and me, and I cannot read it. Therefore, you may open it and read it. So one of the granddaughters or young women in the, in the room read it, and then he picks it up. When it was done, 
It was followed by an universal exclamation, the best letter that ever was written, and round it went through the whole table. How generous, how noble, how magnanimous. I said that it was just such a letter as I expected, only it was infinitely better expressed. A universal cry that the letter ought to be printed. No hold, certainly, not without Mr. Jefferson's express leave. What a, what a great moment when the friendship could easily have broken down here. It could have, and the fact that it didn't was very... Really- revealing and important to each of them obviously and um and you know if you want to reach up to the to the heavens and talk about it it's that that both sides of the revolution are going to continue with it connected and go forward um uh but personally these are two very old men who want to go to the hereafter believing they're still friends and believing that the cause that for which they fought in the 1770s and then served as diplomats in the 1780s abroad, that that, that bond, whatever might have happened in politics, in different policy decisions, even in, in personal affronts or misunderstandings, that that was more important than anything else. And that if they too, let's see if you agree with this, that if, if they too showed a, a, a late life consensus and solidarity on the essential greatness of the of the moment that they had shared as two of the most important coadjutors of the revolution, that that somehow uh, was a greater vindication than either one of them could have expected. Well said, well said, and true. It is almost impossible to imagine a pair of contemporary American political leaders of, of distinction um, but of different convictions, being capable of that. But you'd like to believe that the fact that they did it means that maybe um, it's not impossible. Joseph Ellis, this has been so rich. I wish we were just beginning and not concluding this conversation. We will come back to the letters of Jefferson and Adams. I can assure our listeners, as I know you can, that we have only touched the surface of this extraordinary correspondence. They should take a look at it themselves. Joe, my friend Patricia Limerick of the University of Colorado at Boulder said that every time she reads it through, she slows down in the last 50 pages because she just can't stand to kill the old patriarchs off. Um, it's a it's an amazing piece of work. In this moment of self-quarantine, which we're both undergoing, Indeed. We're all going so, to slow down. Are going to slow down a little bit and digest some of this stuff in a way that we weren't able to in our more full-time professions. And I'll be Adams for a moment. Um, we must not stop, my friend, until we have explained ourselves to each other. There's so much more to say here. Yeah, you've been. I sent you a copy of my new book, Repairing Jefferson's America. You read it, which is a great um, honor to me. You've even agreed to blurb it, which I'm waiting for in the mail, by the way. But uh, ah. you have said to me that that even though you found no factual errors in the book, we have some disagreement about the ver- the argument about what a republic is and whether we still have one. So with your permission, uh, next week, can we talk about that and, and, and see if we can figure out where we agree and where we disagree about the American Republic? It's a date. Fantastic. Uh, we'll see you soon, everyone. Uh, Joseph Ellis in Vermont, Clay Jenkinson in his home, David Swenson in the barn, connected through the miracles of the Internet, uh, without which how would any of us get through uh, this pandemic? You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We'll see you next week for an important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota.
Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you.